Well, as Ken said, we started the day with a talk on uh, economic parameters and, and how they might affect uh, mineral systems and the mineral systems framework. We saw a lot of good case studies. We saw some technologies and methodologies that fit into that framework of mineral systems. And uh, I've been asked here today to, to put some uh, commercial aspects to all of this. So uh, my involvement in the mineral industry goes back about 25 years. I started life as a geophysicist in Bathurst, New Brunswick with Naranda. It's back when I was a young man with a future. Uh, but I stand here today on the dark side. I've, I've mapped now more on the corporate side. I uh, still love the technical aspects of the job, but uh, for my sins, I'm chairman of the four ASX listed companies. So uh, those companies are all junior companies, and uh, that's what I'm getting at when I'm talking about the financially challenged. So um, do mineral systems and does mineral system modeling, mineral system workflow modeling, have a role to play in, in exploration? I certainly think it does. Um, and uh, what I want to talk about today is how it fits commercially. I think it's important that we take some commercial consideration into the development and implementation of mineral system modeling, otherwise it is doomed to fail. Um, if you think about what we're trying to do here and what we're talking about, uh, mineral system modeling, uh, putting a framework about how we explore from, from larger scales to smaller scales, and, uh, and how we map that, that workflow, that should reduce risk that should reduce timelines, it should increase certainty, and generally speaking, when you do all those things, you're adding value. So if we are adding value, if we're able to do that well, that leads to the conclusion that we should be able to attract some investment into this. So, <coughs> I'm losing my voice already. That's you want some water? No, it's okay. okay. Right. I'll let you know if it gets desperate. Um, <laughs> So this is a uh, pretty depressing graph. Um, it's another one that's uh, prepared by Richard Chaudy. It doesn't seem like you can get up here and not have one of his slides, so I thought I'd better put it right up front. Uh, but it kind of shows where we are as junior explorers. Um, this red line is uh, cash reserves on average for 125 listed junior companies here in Australia. And there's about 650 of us, so, so there's a, quite a number of junior explorers out there. Uh, as you can see, it's quickly approaching our admin levels. That means, in general, we have just enough money to keep the lights on. So we, in this climate, we don't have enough money to fund exploration. We certainly don't have enough money to contribute to the development of mineral systems and, and developing mineral system frameworks and things. We are really just struggling to, say, to stay alive. And, and uh, it's not quite as desperate at that as that. When we do get good results, we are able to go out and raise money and still spend money in the ground, which is what our shareholders want to do. But what this graph is telling us basically is that there is a significant difficulty in raising funds, and this translates into reduced exploration activity, and particular in the greenfield space, where the common thinking is, or the convention, conventional wisdom is that uh, Greenfield exploration is going to be left up to the uh, junior explorers, and uh, I'll come to that in, in just a minute, and why I don't think that's necessarily the case. So signatures and mineral systems, are they relevant in a commercial environment? And that's really the question um, that, that I'm asking today, and if you listen to the preamble, I've already given you the answer. Uh, they will improve our understanding and, and increase greenfield success, therefore lowering risk, and therefore add value and be attractive to investors. So can mineral system models help change the negative sentiment that we see in the market today, where investors are, are risk adverse, especially for greenfield exploration? And in terms of greenfield exploration, I'm really referring to that, that stage of exploration where you're going from concept through to discovery. And it's managing that expectation that every hole will be a discovery. And we've talked about that. A number of the speakers have already touched on that. In fact, in it, speaking with shareholders, every activity has to be a success. Um, and we all know that that's not the case, especially in exploration. And the more sophisticated uh, investors understand that that's not the case. But the lack of, of true successes in recent years uh, has resulted in a loss of confidence. And I think that's why... Uh, you see a lot of the areas of the, the market are recovering, they're recovering quite well, recovering quite quickly, but we're not seeing that speculative investment come back into the market just yet. It will come back, 
but uh, but it's not coming back very quickly, and it's certainly not not here yet. So the other uh, aspect of the life of a, of a junior uh, explorer is that we do need to raise money from milestone to milestone as we move through exploration programs towards discovery. And if you think of the average uh, uh, junior explorer here in Australia, typically we IPO on a concept, an idea, a single project, and we raise about four to five million dollars. And we spend that money in the ground, we spend about a million dollars a year on, on overheads and keeping a listing and directors and all those insurances and all those things. But about four million would go into the ground and generally to the, to the people in this room you'd understand that that's not enough to make a greenfield discovery. So it's important that we hit some milestones in between so that we have the capacity to go out and raise further funds to support our activities towards discovery without losing value. And I don't think that's something we've done particularly well as an industry. I think it's something where we can really lift our game. So I think there is a need, this is where mineral systems might come into play, is in managing expectations. There is a need to communicate expected signatures of mineral systems in simple terms, not only amongst geoscientists, because let's face it, um, you know, we, we, we barely talk amongst disciplines. It, it's getting better, but, but it's still that separation between uh, geochemists and geologists and geophysicists is, is still there. Uh, but so, not only in simple, simple terms amongst geoscientists, but also to, uh, for the benefit of investors and decision makers um, in the larger companies. So in terms of my classification of mining companies, and I'm not a, trying to imply that mid-tier and and major companies are part of an evil organization trying to hell-bent on a world domination, but you can take from it what you will. But really, uh, there's a number of different ways of, uh, of classifying major companies on cash flows and revenues and what they mine and everything else. But simply speaking, uh, for today anyways, uh, I'm going to look at mi major and mid-tier companies as producers, developers, Generally, they're brownfield explorers because they're trying to support existing infrastructure, and that just all makes sense. Uh, they do complete or, or participate in greenfield exploration, of course, but this is at a limited stage. And by and large, there is an expectation, whether it's reality or not, but there is an expectation that junior explorers will deliver on the greenfield discoveries. Uh, it's great that we have the mid-tiers and majors there as potential partners, funding partners, technology partners. <coughs> Uh, for the greenfield explorers to go out and complete that greenfield exploration and generally that's where good greenfield work happens. It doesn't generally come from the, uh, the general investment community. Junior companies focus mainly on pure exploration and or feasibility stage projects. Uh, again, we rely on equity financing. We have no other uh, income uh, unless you're fortunate enough on an R&D tax concession or, or something like that. But uh, generally, you rely on, on healthy equity markets to go out and finance your projects. So that's my di differentiation in, in the classification of mining companies. So now another Richard Chaudhy slide, just to say that we, we do make a large percent of the discoveries were, uh, sorry, worldwide. Uh, they do come out of junior explorers, uh, exploring in greenfield terrains. <coughs> Um, this is a bit misleading because I, I personally think that uh, much of this exploration is actually supported by major mid-tier companies in alliance with the junior partners as well. But it, it does go to show that there is um, some significance in, in junior exploration making a large number of the discoveries globally. Now, despite being uh, tagged with the, the group that is going to do the majority of Greenfield Explorers, Juniors are often first movers into greenfield terrains. However, we are reluctant greenfield explorers. The reality is that we have pressure from our investors, from our shareholders, um, for near-term exploration returns. And so they don't want to see us going into long-term exploration in, in unproven and, and high-risk areas unless we have a balance with some brownfield near-term uh, areas as well. So you'll often see, and I think Alan Trench has written on this, where you'll often see a balance of, uh, in, a, in a junior's portfolio between Greenfield and, uh, and Brownfield. So again, I come back to that question, you know, can an improved mineral system framework uh, impact the ability of companies like the ones I'm involved with uh, to raise capital? 
and the timing of returns? Can it shorten that time, time frame between the different milestones? Um, and again, that's critical because from concept to discovery, we seem to be in this never-ending cycle of requiring money from milestone to milestone. And if you don't hit those milestones, that's when it becomes a real struggle. And you start to lose value, uh, which again is, uh, is not good for shareholders. So just uh, in summary, what does the life cycle of a junior miner look like? Um, I don't really know if Brent Cook is an authority on the matter, but when you Google life cycle of a junior miner, this is the first image that comes up. So <laughs> not wanting to argue with Google, this is the one I'm using. <laughs> so this is what I said. This is the area that we're really focused on, I think, with, with mapping uh, mineral systems and understanding mineral systems is that concept through to pre-discovery and then, and then discovery. And as you can see, in relative value terms, that's a very slow period for investors. Now, Brent has come up with a four to five year uh, timeline here, and that's probably reality, sadly, but if I went up in front of a group of, of shareholders or potential investors and said, look, I only need your money for four or five years, you might see a return, <laughs> probably not gonna fly. <laughs> So we have to shorten that timeline. And if mineral system modeling and a, and a workflow um, around mineral systems can uh, uh, shorten that timeline, that would be fantastic. Um, people are in it, of course, the uh, true speculators, because that discovery hole, um, that's when you add the most value in an exploration play. Uh, I don't agree with this big trough here. It's generally a flat line in the feasibility and development stage, and then you get full value once the, uh, the mine is in production and further reserves might be defined, etc. Now this, uh, this graph really isn't far off reality. Uh, this is a, a, just a quick look at serious resources. Um, you know, they were involved in a number of exploration plays, not just uh, the uh, Nova discovery in the Fraser Range, but there was a number of exploration plays um, contributing to, uh, or happening concurrently during this phase of the life of, of serious resources, but I've just focused on some of the goals that they kicked from an early exploration context. So these are some of the milestones that you'd want to see. You know, you're in a greenfield terrain, you've gone out, you've intersected in shallow drilling, some of the footpath elements, some nickel, copper, and cobalt, um, elevated values, nothing too splashy, it's nothing worth mentioning in terms of grade, uh, but you know that you're in a mineralized system, Further drab drilling confirms some targets. You've gone out and done your footprint geophysics. You've defined some conductors. You're ready to go drilling. And all through that phase, there's no increase in value as you meet those milestones. Now, with hindsight, we would have loved to have all invested back in here. And we should have all invested back in here, but why didn't we? I mean, some of us did, some of us didn't. Steve? Uh, anyways. The, um, the message here is, is there a better way of explaining those results in the context of the mineral system? And is there a simple way to do it that investors could understand so that they would understand the significance of those results moving towards discovery? And, and you wouldn't expect this to, to go up in a, in a linear fashion, but you'd expect some increase towards that, that uh, 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 groundbreaking discovery, you know, where they had this massive upward. And this is the, that's of course is the Nova discovery, that's the Bollinger discovery. Um, and then you see the, uh, the effects of feasibility, which is a pretty slow time for, uh, for explorers. And development down at the back end there, I think they actually went down on the day, which is, which is disappointing and tells you where the market is at. So I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with, with a number of the frameworks that have been discussed at this meeting, and I won't go through them in detail. Uh, because they, they have been discussed this morning. Um, I particularly like the idea of the three independent uh, criteria and where they overlap. Well, that's a good place for, for ore bodies to, to form. And I think that's a fairly easy framework for investors to understand. It's something that they can get their mind around. Um, this is a more complex diagram, but perhaps uh, the devil is in the detail. And I do like this concept of moving uh, through scale with, with footpaths to footprints to direct detection and the ore body. Um, and I think both of these frameworks 
can play a role in communicating expiration results and added value ultimately in that early phase of expiration. Uh, I'm going to shift gear, just go through some of the uh, some of the work that we're doing in the, the different companies that I'm involved with. Um, Musgrave Minerals was formed in 2011 as primarily as a greenfield explorer. Uh, we uh, currently have a tenement in uh, in the Fraser Range that we were fortunate to uh, to peg when the ground came available. It uh, became available after the discovery of Nova and Bollinger, and we were one of eight exploration companies to peg that ground. And in WA, if you have a valid application with meet certain technical criteria, your name goes in the hat, literally. And, uh, and it goes through a ballot process, and we're fortunate enough to win the ballot. Now, what I wanted to comment on here is that um, when we won this tenement, uh, so this is we won the application, so the tenement's not granted. It is granted now, but at the time it wasn't six months ago. Our share price went up, I think it was about 30%, just on the back of an application that just happens to be about 150 kilometers away on trend with Nova and Bollinger, and, and to me that it's not rational, but the market isn't necessarily <laughs> rational. Uh, if you took Nova and Bollinger off that map, and we announced that we'd take this wonderful ground in the Fraser Range, it would go through, you know, it's got the fertility, it's got the right geodynamics, and it's got the right uh, right structure with these deep-seated mantle tapping uh, faults and things on the edge of the Craton boundary, the market would have said, hold on. So we have a long way to go in explaining mineral systems <clears throat> to investors. They do understand uh, proximity plays, and, and rightfully so, that's a simple one to understand, but can we do better in the context of, a, of a describing a mineral system to, uh, to investors, and I think we can. You might notice that I have a lot of ideas and a lot of questions, but not really any answers. <laughs> that's going to be a theme until the end of the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> And even after the end of the presentation, that's really the theme. So, Musgraves was uh, was born as a greenfield explorer. There was a conceptual play. Uh, its birthplace was in the <coughs> South Australia. And this graph really hasn't come out very well. You'll have to trust me. Let's go to this one. It's uh, based on a large land holding in the northwest corner of uh, South Australia. It's the Musgrave Province. The Musgrave Province uh, on the WA side of the border is host to the Nebo and Babel deposits, nickel sulfide deposits found by WMC, um, associated with these purple units, which are the Giles complex, which you can see come through the, uh, the South Australian portion of the Musgraves. Now, it's been well documented that this is extremely prospective terrain, but access has been limited historically. There's been virtually no modern day exploration completed in the area until about the last five years. Musgrave, through six joint ventures basically, or a six-way joint venture, was able to put together a very large land holding, 55,000 square kilometers. So 5% of South Australia. On the back of that, we were able to, and it's a pure greenfield play, there was, we had drill-ready targets, but that's about it. We were able to go out and raise $2 million in April 2011. And that was really the, the last significant greenfield exploration float. I, I don't think we've seen one of that scale for greenfield exploration uh, since that time. So, what what am I getting at with this slide? Uh, I said before that you know we we have difficulty selling greenfields to, to shareholders and the market. It generally comes down to market conditions. So, when market conditions are good for the right play, you can attract significant amounts of money to go and do proper greenfield work. And we have had some technical success in the, oh, let's just skip that one for the sake of time. Um, we have had some, not what did it come either, but anyways, we have had some technical success in the, uh, in the Musgraves. There's a gravity image in the background, um, you know, showing some part of that deep-seated uh, plumbing system. Uh, there's the mantle tapping structure, uh, the manfall that runs up the northern side of this gravity feature. There's a number of intrusions coming up. We've compared the structure around our palitude target to that of Nebo and Babel, and it looked very similar. So we flew an airborne survey. We came up with a, a number of conductors. Um, we went out there, did the, uh, the initial 
uh, rab drilling, we had some geophysical, or sorry, some geochemical anomalies in uh, nickel and copper in particular. Uh, we drilled the conductors and we we're hitting these narrow intervals of uh, massive salt lines at the base of, of what we're interpreting to be the basal contact of this, uh, uh, this magnetic unit. So from a magmatic nickel sulfide point of view, it's ticking all the boxes on a technical, um, from a technical point of view, you just need this to be higher grade and probably about uh, 10 to 15 times thicker. But uh, that aside, it's a, it's a very compelling story because it demonstrated in a, in a greenfield environment, you're going out, you're applying a mineral systems approach. You're able to demonstrate the fertility of this particular Mavic unit, there's 20 kilometers of strike there that remains untested, and that work is work that remains to be completed. So that's uh, something that we'll get onto uh, as soon as we have uh, some access uh, agreements uh, sorted out. How are we going for time? Okay. Good. Yeah. I guess the second example I wanted to talk about, we'll move from Musgrave Minerals now to Mithril Resources. Uh, Mithril is, uh, has been quite active throughout Australia for a number of years and very much a greenfield explorer again. Um, we uh, acquired a, through a joint venture with Intermin a, a, a land holding just outside of Mikathera along the UME shear zone, which is this white line here, thinking that you know, it fit all the, the criteria, if you will. It had uh, demonstrated fertility along the belt with a, a number of small mineral prospects. The Nanadi well copper deposit itself is a low-grade copper sulfide resource. It's got about 150,000 tons of contained copper, um, so that was attractive. Um, the the geodynamics were, were less clear, um, but there's still a compelling case to uh, there's still a compelling case that there's an active plumbing system there that could deliver uh, not a hydrothermal copper deposit that. Uh, that uh, I guess the previous explorers had classified Nanadi well as, but we were going in thinking, well, this is a good place to go look for magnetic nickel sulfides again, being one of the areas where we have some expertise. So as I said, uh, Nanadi well was the known prospect. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, we thought that we should be focusing closer to the structure. It's very uh, basic exploration. Um, there was a Gaussian sitting out here on the Stark Prospect, we noticed that it was enriched in nickel at surface. So that led us to go back to Nanadi Well and resample some of the core assay for nickel and PGEs. And lo and behold, it wasn't just a low grade copper deposit, it actually had elevated nickel and elevated PGEs as well. So instead of hydrothermal, you started to think, well, this is a magmatic system. And it changes your view on how you might explore this area. So this Gaussian was of immediate interest. Uh, we started doing some geochem along that structure. We had another geochem uh, anomaly up here at this northern conductor. So we went out and did some ground geophysics to see if there was any, conductor, uh, any conductors associated with the, uh, the anomalism that we had mapped out in the Gaussian. And sure enough, there, there was. Uh, this is the, um, yeah, so the northern, uh, that's the, uh, yeah, so at the uh, Stark Prospect, we had a pretty good conductor, the northern conductor, and then this conductor also on the same structure down to the south. So we went out there and drilled some holes in, um, back to that in a second. We went out and drilled some holes in December. Uh, the, this Gaussian had, had already been drilled. And that's what these drill hole traces are. But not understanding the context of the model, they didn't test the contact between the Mavic unit, the Gabbro, and the, uh, the surrounding sediments. So we were keen on testing the contact. Also, when we did the ground EM, the conductor was, uh, you know, the top of the conductor was sitting in here at around 100 meters depth. So we wanted to test the center of the conductor. Um, the, uh, the initial drilling hit predominantly semi-massive and disseminated sulfides over a narrow interval. And then we had this broad interval of disseminated sulfides. Still not an economic discovery, but certainly interesting that at the base of this intrusion, we had four meters of about 2% copper. I apologize, I don't think you probably read that. Four meters of just uh, under 2% copper and uh, roughly a gram platinum palladium uh, 
uh, gold with elevated nickel as well, with about 0.2% nickel. So we think we're on to a new discovery. It's an emerging discovery. Uh, we've done a follow-up hole now under this. Uh, we've been diked out, but the story isn't finished. Uh, the down hole EM is telling us that there's plenty of off-hole conductivity that we have to go and chase. And uh, that's just some of the profiles there, but I don't have the models, so. Um, but look, this is, uh, we think that this is a fantastic start to, uh, uh, to an exploration project. Uh, of course, we announced that as an emerging discovery, the share price went down. <laughs> Again, managing expectations. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it is very difficult and disheartening, but that's just the state of the market. And I can stand up here and complain about the market all day, but it's like listening to a farmer complain about the weather, isn't it? So, never, never going to be right. So just as a, a last example, and, and uh, this is an unlisted uh, company that we put together. Uh, we pegged some ground that we believe is an extension of the Mount Reed Volcanics in uh, western Tasmania. So it's got high potential for a polymetallic uh, silver lead or uh, BMS style deposits in the Mount Reed Volcanics. Uh, it's certainly got some nickel potential in the ultramagnets down there. And we've actually found a new nickel Dawson that we're, we're following up with no drilling today. Um, but there is a porphyry target down there that was originally identified um, back in the uh, late 80s that has seen very little work. And that's really got our attention. Now, where it sits in the broad context of a porphyry system and mineral systems, we're, we're trying to work out. But this is a magnetic image, um, reduced pole residual magnetic image. And it's this uh, circular feature in the middle of the map that, uh, that we're focused on. This is the what we're calling the Thomas Creek Porphyry Target. Um, it's got some structural complexity to it that's quite interesting. There's a major, if you look on the gravity image, there's a, a major north-south liniment uh, that could be that mantle tapping uh, structure uh, to, the, uh, to the east. Um, but what we like about this target is its geometry, its shape, uh, the fact that it has a demagnetized zone, or what we're interpreting to be a demagnetized uh, uh, zone in the middle of a, of a high magnetic feature. Um, the previous work included some soil geochemistry and they had up to 7% copper in soil so clearly there is some, some sulfides or some oxide, likely oxide around. Um, and uh, up to uh, 3 grams gold as well. So we are seeing an almost copper and gold at surface associated with this magnetic feature. Um, the, uh, we completed a bit of chargeability just to see what the, the chargeability signature might be. And we're certainly getting some strong chargeability anomalies associated with it as well, where we believe it's demagnetized, which is of interest, indicating that there's likely a, a significant sulfide component to this feature as well. It's about five kilometers across, so the scale is, uh, is right as well. But we need to still step out and see where this fits in terms of the mineral system context. So that's what we're trying to do. Now this is an unlisted entity, so as difficult as it is to raise money for listed entities, it is incredibly difficult to raise money right now for uh, unlisted entities. But this is one that we'll continue to plug away at. It's a, it's a developing story um, and one where a mineral system approach will definitely be used going forward. So it's a bit of a watch this space. I should say that there has been some historic drilling at Thomas Creek. We have hit some uh, alteration, or the, the historic drilling did hit alteration and some uh, some mineralization that would be consistent with the porphyry system, but we're still not clear as to where we fit in that uh, porphyry system at the present time. And as you can see, some elevated levels of, uh, of copper as well. So just to, uh, to wrap up, um, greenfield exploration continues to, to struggle because it continues to uh, struggle to attract funding. I guess decision makers in large companies, investors, and fund junior explorers will continue to favor brown rules. The, the returns are much more attractive. They're, they're generally shorter time frame and, and they're generally the same order of magnitude. Um, so we need to lower the risk of greenfield exploration by increasing our success rates. And I think that's why we need to, to be talking about mineral systems, and we need to talk about mineral systems framework and workflow 
that delivers milestones that we can communicate easily to the market so that we can look to raise money on the back of those, uh, those milestones and achieving those milestones. I've got some, uh, some measures that I, I put in there, you know, how do you measure success for a junior company that's uh, pre-discovery, enterprise value is one of them. Uh, I'm happy to share my thoughts on that over a beer, but I'll, I think I'll leave that one for now. Okay. Um, but the imperative for greenfield exploration, uh, read of, we, we've gone through a lot of this already. Uh, again, um, I think mineral systems can play a role, it's just a question of Will they in influence investors to buy into greenfield projects? And uh, it depends on what kind of structure we come up with. But that's where it needs to be to get the support. Okay. That's it for me, Ken. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> I put the, uh, the most relevant quote in there the, from market sentiment's point of view. And this is taken from a newsletter where he goes through why you want to be into producers and not junior explorers, etc., etc., etc. And then he closes off with this statement. That being said, to expose yourself to potentially mind-numbing tax bracket altering returns, you should be involved in the in junior explorers. <laughs> Any questions for before we let him off the stage? Steve, Dave. Um, if I understand you correctly, the um, we need to do undercover conceptual new grassroots exploration, but there is no funding. That's what I'm getting at, yeah. Cool. <laughs> in good times, there is. I guess, yeah. more to the point, I guess in good times, yeah. you can go and raise money for greenfield exploration. Um, it's still difficult, but you can go raise the money. We need to come up with models and systems and programs that can survive the, the cycles that are robust enough to survive the, the downturn. Otherwise, exploration projects get orphaned, just like the development uh, of R&D projects as well. Uh, Mark. Is there any evidence that privately held companies are better explorers because they have less of a pressure on them to deliver short-term gain? I haven't seen any evidence, so I really can't comment on it. Um, a number, I know, uh, a number of shareholders or a number of investors would argue that uh, privately held companies are a better vehicle because you don't suffer the fluctuations in the market, but then you know you're really holding something that's not that has no liquidity as well. So eventually, you have to find a way to to uh, monetize your your investment as well. But in terms of effectiveness, I don't I haven't seen anything one way or the other. Yeah, great. Um, you. We're looking at the, the uh, serious journey sideways and slightly downwards until, until the discovery hole. Um, I was there for part of that journey early on. And I guess the, there are two factors usually at play in that, in that period. One, obviously, is this progression of projects, results, milestones being met. And the other one is the drawdown of cash reserves. And that's what you have to publish regularly is your cash statements and the yeah. investors look at that and they say well we put 10 million in and now there's only 5 million and okay you've made these you've got these results is that worth the 5 million that we've dropped and if it isn't then your share price goes down and it continues to drift down and Mark Bennett's on, on record is you know when they drilled those RC holes that found massive sulfide that was the last drilling, not just for the year, that was the that last was drilling, yeah. mm -hmm. because they didn't have any money left in the bank, and unless Mark Creasy or somebody was going to put some more money in, they were going to be in the same category as the rest of the you know, West Perth juniors who were just sort of tickling over with the, with the lights barely on. So it's, it's a very tricky period to operate in. Um, the, Theology that was followed, certainly when I was there as exploration manager, was spend. Yeah. We just spent as fast as we could. It was go for broke, but on very good projects, very good prospects, and, and we were constrained more by the availability of drill rigs than we were on the availability of dollars in the bank. But at the end of the day, once the tank was dry, the tank was going to be dry. Um, and I think if you now look at what Mark has been able to do in the development phase, he has gone from discovery to starting digging a mine in three years. 
I know, it's and, incredible. And that They're is what's result. possible if you just keep going and you have a strong belief in what you're doing and the approach that you're having. Um, so, you know, we, we, we talked earlier, and I, I guess this is sort of working a bit more into the discussion session, but I have a real problem with this concept that things are going to take longer and cost more into the future. Well, they can. That is, if you sell, if you told that to the expiration investment yeah. market, they would all run away and only invest in IT companies. And I agree, they can't. There, there's a couple of points I yeah. just follow up on. Then, um, one, you mentioned funding risk, and right now the biggest risk we have in in the junior sector is, is that it's funding risk, and that has the strongest downward pressure on our share price. People knowing that even if you have good results, like the result we had in, in Mithril. People know, oh well, you know, I looked at your last quarter, you know, you're coming back to the market. So I'm not going to invest now, I'll wait until you get the funding, and then I'll look to invest once that risk is removed. And I, I think that has had a, such a downward pressure on, on on so many companies that you know we're now Mithril's trading sub a cent. You know, we've got a market cap of about uh, I think in today's price about three million. You know, there was one point where we had twelve million in the bank. Um, and I would argue that our projects are worth a lot more than the market cap of, of, of the three million at the present time. And that comes to the second measure, which, you know, really, even if your cash is going down, your enterprise value should be going up. And the enterprise value being the, the value of your market cap, less your cash and your, your liquid assets. You know, you, you'd want to see that your company's value is at least increasing proportionally to the invested capital. And as an industry as a whole, uh, an exploration industry, not necessarily the, the producers, but an exploration industry, we have a horrible track record on, on showing a return on invested capital. And I think that's why we only get the speculative money coming in to early stage green deal projects. You know, once you've had that discovery, it, it's never easy raising money, but once you've had that discovery, you're talking about timelines to development, you can, you can go to the institutional investors and it's a different level of investors. And generally, institutional investors follow their money throughout the feasibility phase towards development. They're not selling in or selling out on, on milestones like you get in the early stage of exploration. Um, Steve touched on it today, and I guess Graham with you up there, and Alan <coughs> talked around it too, but to me, the the old term 800 pound gorilla in the room has to be the government. Um, Shoddy touched on it. He said this this mature undercover stuff is really the three wealthiest explorers in the world, the countries of Australia, Canada, and America. And if the governments don't step up to the plate and deal with some of the risk of the long term de development of geoscience infrastructure, um, Guys like Graham aren't going to be hanging around that much longer. I mean, he's going to be looking for stuff that his investors are going to say, give me the stuff in 18 months or, or two years. And there are places like West Africa and maybe parts of South America, parts of Asia. There's choices to be made. And, and I think governments really have to be part of that discussion because, I mean, they think it's over now that they're doing great mag and radiometric surveys. Well, that's bullshit. That was what was good 60 years ago, for Pete's sake, you know, when the magnetometers are first invented. And I know South Australia has been pioneering with some stuff, co-sharing on risk, drilling some holes with companies and things like that. Well, the, 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 the Uncover yeah. program, you know, they're contributing a couple of million bucks there um, that companies are taking advantage of. Uh, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I don't think, I don't think government is the answer. Well, some of the, uh, the long-term, uh, uh, if you need long-term programs... Uh, at the development phase, sure. Right. Sure, at, but, at the early development phase, but the implementation phase, it's certainly not going to be... Well, you can use the data if it's available to you. Yeah, not even the data, but the workflow and the framework, sure. I would take a little bit of issue with that as well, because um, I think the reality in this jurisdiction are that people that are doing the most effective quantum of new work and new thinking and new stuff are probably the government funded people. I don't think the industry is doing that much at all, to be honest. I've got a comment, obviously. Um, the, 
But one of the things that's driving uncover is the simple financial reality of what will happen to the revenue stream of Australia if we don't find new world-class systems. It's quite devastating for the, for the government. And therefore, we have to find something. And it, yet we must balance Tim's comments, which is, how come this is, this at the moment, the workflow looks like it's going to take longer and have lower success than the already damning statistics of our discovery record already? And yet we want to respond to that <coughs> by making just incremental advances. We're facing Australia, Canada, and America are facing reality, which is diversify out, in particular Canada and Australia, out of what they do, or solve some issues. So for those of us who want to be employed in this industry going forward, or for Graham who wants to raise money going forward, we have to improve our ability to explore by quite a considerable margin on a time frame that's quite tight. And if we want to do that by playing around the edges, which is what we do, then we are going to be, we're going to have trouble. The government will raise revenue in other ways. That's what will happen. They won't go, oh, well, they'll just sit there and try another way. As we've already seen with this local government's response to the iron ore or the Zambian's response to the, to the copper, they will find other ways of raising revenue in the shorter time frame that they require. So, Steve, so where do you think that next big bang is, though? I mean, is it, you know, um, I mean, I was interested in looking at quite a bit of MT. We look at, you know, like from the government side of things, collecting more MT across, you know, Australia uh, to complement then other ideas. But you know, I think we we'll probably need additional data as well, though. What do you think we've got all the data we need? Um, I think it was in James's slide a little earlier in terms of people in this room, which is we need to do a hell of a lot better job of what we've already got okay. to earn the right to collect new data as well. Okay. If we're going to ask government for the kind of level of investment that's required, which is multiple billions, a million. That's going to be a tall ask. We're only five minutes out of a place where iron ore miners were making, or still are making, billion, multi billion dollar profits like yourself. And yet, um, we're going to turn around and ask the government for handouts. It's, we've got to balance the fact that we've just come off a boom where people are making money hand over fist. Governments aren't going to respond. So we've got this horrible situation where we're going to be the architects of our own issues. Well, actually, populist. Politics has spent the proceeds of the boom instead of tucking it away as it should have been. Yeah. But no sense crying out to build it now. I, I, there is no simple one answer to this problem. It's going to have to be attacked on multiple fronts. But one of the most obvious things to do is someone's got to talk to Canada and explain the severity of the problem and hope that there is a, an understanding here, realistically, and they don't immediately respond by looking at it. I just, I guess, my other query is um, the other elephant in the room is the majors, BHP, Rio Tinto, Bali, sitting on mountains of cash, buying their own shares back. Yeah, spending that money buying their own shares and, and, and very little on, on exploration. I'm particularly maybe somehow how can we encourage those guys back into the exploration business to define these big mineral systems? Well, we've never left. <laughs> A, a few of few of our contemporaries have, but I work for Rio, and we we still do green fields exploration. Um, you know, we've, we've been back out. What's, the budget? What's the, your expression budget this year? Um, worldwide, fifty million. Worldwide, two hundred million. Two hundred million. Okay. But uh, you have to separate the green fields bit uh, out from the brown. Fields. So there's an awful lot of camouflage brown fields in. There. <laughs> but, but realistically, it's a, it's a very healthy budget. budget yeah. okay. But it were also, though, Grant, probably, there, you know, 20 years ago there was others operating that space, but now there's very few majors. It, it, it has got a lot of spark, you're quite right. So, but, you know, not everybody has moved out of Greenfield Exploration. But I mean, you're, you're in those same curves that Shoddy shows that $100 billion was spent in the last decade. There weren't many tier ones found. Absolutely. So it's sort of like well, you may be spending the money, money, but you know, collectively, the impact. Even though you, you know, I know, I know, Steve yeah. Mack likes to say you stand above the rest, but I mean, collectively, you know, it's you look pretty much the same as everybody else in terms of the, <laughs> at least the community. We look pretty much the same. Yeah, well, that's, that's, but it's always been there. I mean, this, this this has been around a long time. This debate. And the reality is, the granularity of exploration since the 70s, when the first analyses were done by McKinsey, has demonstrated there are a large number of unsuccessful players and a few 
successful players. And, and the junior versus major thing, all that stuff, it's, it's really a, it's a bit of a smoke screen. It's, it's kind of a bit where you are when the, when the, when the funding runs out in any part of the business you're in, because if it's not shareholder patients that runs out, it's management patients that runs out. One question, yep. Brian, is uh, how much of that Greenfield's money is being spent in this country? Um, I can't remember the exact numbers, but I don't know whether the boss has made it public, but it's, it's, a, it's a decent budget. Well, we believe it's a decent budget. I've got a question for Graham. Is the, um, <coughs> is how much do, does the investment community have people who understand the, the step change in approach to exploration, the this mineral systems approach? Does the investment community support that or are they aware of it? No, they, 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 at, at that early development level, you're, you're generally looking to high net worth individuals, um, uh, retail investors, right? You're, you're not really at the stage where you're attracting institutional investors or or brokers that would have access to an analyst to keep them informed of the, the technical nuances of, of what we're trying to do here. And that's what I'm trying to get at with, uh, with we have to come up with a framework that we can communicate in easy terms and show that we've met milestones in very simple terms. Because that technical expertise won't, won't exist at those early stages. It's fair to say when you say doing prospectus, it's easier if we've got a red dot that we're going to go out and, and yeah, drill. Exactly. Than, exactly. You know, some sort but of that's system. quite often. Yeah. That's why we do turn to the majors and the mid tiers to look for funding support in a joint venture. If you if you measure it up, that's the most dilutive way for a junior to raise money, because you're giving up a direct interest in the project. But we know that the story is too technical, really, to get across the line any other way. So you have to go to to one of the uh, funding partner that has that technical expertise um, to be able to screw this approach. And so. well, that's parallel been around for a very long time. Yeah. yeah. Hundreds of years. So I think that we're spending more and finding less. So it really needs a new technological breakthrough, <coughs> a new technique, something that can take us um, to the next level. To fix that, I can't see it by tinkering around the edges and going the way we're going. Yeah, you're right, but it, it's it's actually it's a, it's a bit of decoupling as well from expenditure. I mean, if you spend nothing, you'll find nothing. But if you spend a lot, it doesn't mean you find a lot. <laughs> no, that's that's been demonstrated somewhere in one of the Johnny slides as well, I think. So. And yeah. the reality is we're, we're spending less as an industry as a whole over the last three or four years. We're, we're certainly spending. Well, it's interesting in Can in Canada. There's a guy. Some of you probably know Pierre Lassonde has, has made a uh, exploded at a couple of meetings. One, the first time I heard him was in '06 at an SEG meeting in Keystone, and then he threw it out last year at the Roundup. And he said, you know, where's the where's the, th the equivalent in mining of 3D seismic? He says, there's just, you don't seem to have breakthrough technologies, you know, and he implored the audience with an earshot, and uh, I've actually heard some people are thinking about, you know, trying to approach Pierre to see if he could free up some of his vast wealth uh, to, to help with that, but it's, it's interesting, I mean, I, I, I tried to engage, well, he was with Newmont at the time in 06, and, and Steve Enders was his exploration manager, and, you know, Perry Eaton was the director of geoscience, and, and it was interesting. I said, "Well, you know, you really, you really, there isn't a simplification uh, like in the oil business. Not that, not that there's slouches. They've done a huge amount of work over over half a century to have that very high rate of performance that they call it enjoy. I remember a colleague who was actually a guy that uh, I know and Graham work with." Uh, um, John Gingrich, and he said, you know, they had an oil division that time in Miranda, and he said they were getting like 80 and 90 percent success rates on their on their drilling, and that's what they were used to because the technologies work so well. But we add our layers of complexity, of, you know, the mineral system. We love it and we hate it. We should, but the complexity of all, you know, alteration effects, structure, 
weathering, and then we try and image down. I mean, even the, you know, Mark says we got to have a thousand models, and we might figure some things out. You know, the oil guys would probably just say, you know, why are we even in that business? I remember it was one of the first ASIG meetings I went to. There was a guy from BHP Petroleum. He's describing some work, um, not on the west slope, but on, on the north side. He says, you know, if our technology won't work, we won't explore. If we can't demonstrate that we can work successfully in an area, we're not going to go in there because he says we know we're just going to piss money off against the wall. And I thought, geez, you know, that's that's pretty cool. And that was before the Pete Rose risk assessment procedures came out in the early '90s, where a lot of companies were in the oil business losing money, and they become they became much more formalistic about risk assessment. It still struggles in our industry to to put boxes that anybody really believes around these these, these risk assessments. I don't think anybody can place the real risk. Well, it was interesting, Bruce, because I went back, John Gingrich again, he worked with Pete Rose and some of the guys there and put some stuff together in Iran in the late 90s. And uh, when did he live, was 03? He gave a talk at the, yeah. Yeah. he gave a talk at the PDAC. He, I think he had just left, I remember it was somebody from, some guy from WMC was very interested in what he's doing. But anyways, I went back to John about three or four years after that and I said, you know, would it be worth putting like a workshop together on this risk assessment? And he says, yeah, yeah, he says, I could help. And then he kind of like, you know, he got droopy and he said, well, he says, it's not actually, it's not something that rises up from, from the ground level, from the work floor. He says, the executives of the companies in oil all got together almost, you know, a few started, they go to the same racquetball club or something. And he says, it was pushed down from the top. He says they forced the change, a, a cultural change in the way oil industry worked. It wasn't the knowledge of the individual technologists that made the difference. They were really more, you know, like the drone ants. They were just doing their job. And until the, 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 the guys, the CEOs and the CFOs said, you've got to do this, one of their advantages being you go into, I think, a, a boardroom in an oil company, Everybody around that boardroom, the HR guy, the CFO, they all know what seismic does. It basically finds oil. <laughs> and you go to a mining company, I don't think there's many people in that boardroom of the directors that really understand that. Does seismic find more oil or does it actually just set the petroleum system into a yeah. framework? They get pretty close to finding oil. They get close, yeah. but realistically, right spot. Yeah. Yeah. the seismic yeah. comes hand in hand with the petroleum system. I think the point is, it has a higher success rate. The, break, the breakthrough in, in auto has not been in, in seismic, it's actually been in fracking. Mm -hmm. So that's been a big step change for, for them. Certainly yeah. onshore. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's completely out of left field, I think. Maybe well, they knew about it for a long time, but I think it was solving those technological problems of the horizontal drilling and the micro seismics. It's a real, it's a really neat piece of work if you get it yeah. to talk. Anyways, I don't want to hog this. This was really time for you folks to question the, the speakers while they're still here. I don't just, think we need to go to the road of a panel and such. But. One point on these discussions, there was a gentleman retiring, must about 30 plus years in CRA and RTZ and RTX rate into expiration. And um, I said to him, so what patterns have you seen that have led to discoveries over the years? Is it Geophys, is it geochemistry? What really were the you know step change things? And he said, I said, and how can we apply that forward? And his opinion was that the technology never really led to a fundamental change in amount of discoveries. It doesn't isolate the cases, but he said the one thing that really makes a difference is good quality ideas. And I think that's why this mineral systems thing is good because everything we've just discussed today is there's bits of technology, but Essentially, the mineral system is the value of good quality applied ideas and thinking. <coughs> Something that was all stolen from him. It's none of my thinking. Yeah. <coughs> any specific questions for any of the speakers? I imagine you still. Well, we, we won't grill you anymore, Graham. Captain Hand. I've got one for Dave Clark actually about remnants. You know, typically, you know, so it's usually, you know, most often present. And typically, I suppose we'd recognise it when we're looking at, say, you know, if things low, it's obvious, or if you've got an unusual dipolar pattern, then it's also obvious. But if you then take those sources and push them down a kilometre, it's going to be, I think, much more difficult to recognise. 
remnants. I'm just wondering what sort of strategy we can use to... Well, only if the signature just gets buried in the noise. But, I mean, if you can see, if you can still see the signature of a, of a distinct source, of a discrete source, then, then you can recognise the remnants just as well. But the problem is, the deeper you go, the more it's going to merge, that signature is going to merge with other stuff. We could, as it goes deeper, though, you'll lose, you know, you often lose that sort of dipolar effect and have like a, you know, monopolar response. You know, as the source gets deeper, I'm just thinking, how would you, you know, recognise remnants of that in that case? Yeah, I just think everything gets broadened and then it overlaps with other sources, and it's hard you to, to recognise it. You need to separate it from the the background, mm -hmm. and uh, once sources are merging, yeah, it blurs the. Yeah. You got the, the experts here. Throw your questions out. Life changing experiences. <laughs> well, just a comment to somebody else, the same thing at the moment. Um, I, I don't think we're going to find a really whiz bang new super technology that's going to be a game breaker in mining geophysics uh, because, look, let's face it, we all know what the fundamental forces of nature are, and we've you know, pretty much exploited Maxwell's equations to the, to the limit. Things will get incrementally better, and that's great, but I think the best the thing we can do is we're not really using the existing data sets well, well enough. We're not, we, do, yeah, we need to think more about how to use them, and you know, mineral systems approach and everything is, is the right way to go. But in many other ways, we need to actually just spend more time analysing the data properly and, and really thinking about what it means. And I know in mining companies, people are under such pressure, they don't have a lot of time to to, to analyse the data properly, and uh, that's, I guess, where the research community and, 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 and uh, some of the you know, smart you know, people, in, contractors and things who are doing uh, developing software need to, need to really step up and, and just you know, get more out of the data. But even existing data sets, I mean, I know lots of really good magnetic data sets that have never been interpreted properly. And, and, yeah. The um uh, this is, one of the societies I belong to is the Society of uh, Exploration Geophysics. It's dominated by oil guys, right? But they they have a, a column um, they call Interpreter Sam. It's actually written written by a guy whose name is Don Heron. But the John had a slide up. <clears throat> he grabbed a piece from from one of my pieces that I had grabbed flagrantly from from Don Heron and. And he, he says within the oil industry, they are falling behind. He says the acquisition of data far exceeds their ability to understand the results. And a lot of their interpretation processes and methodologies, he says, are really 10 or 15 years old. They really haven't advanced that far. They're, they're kind of resting on their laurels in a way. But one of the terms, and it was in that line that John had, was he said, we're losing the soap time, the time to sit down Think about information intelligently, you know, just to try and cope because we're really good on the processing. But you, you know, if you've got 500 images of something or other, some derivatives, and step slices, and you know, uh, you, you spend most of your time organizing it, so then you can spend five percent of your time looking at it. And and I think you know, there's a component to me always, at least the way I've worked, is that I like working with other people, but I also need quiet time for myself to look at these things and make associations. And it's not just getting together in a big think tank and somehow you're going to nut it out. It's like a scrum, you know, whoever, who's there ever the alpha person, will get their decision will be the, the outcome that gets presented to management or whatever. But he, they actually, the, the, um, the SEG, in part, uh, with funds from Statoil, I think it's now, it's probably five years ago, Statoil is the big Norwegian oil company. They gave the SEG five million dollars to try and come up with ways to better interpret data. And one of the outcomes was that the SEG formed a closer alliance with the AAPG, the American Association of Petroleum Geologists, and they produced a new journal called Interpretation. It'll only be published once every four times a year. But it's a joint, it's a joint publication. Trying to get, even in the oil industry, trying to get the geophysicists and the geologists working more closely together. 
And so, it, it, you know, we look at the oil guys like, well, they obviously spend a lot of money and they got big, bigger booths than we do. Uh, <laughs> but hey, uh, and they're having a meeting in Melbourne, which caused, I know Greg Street was a little frumpy about it, that they're having with PISA, SEG and, and it, uh, AAPG in Melbourne later this year. And the AACG wasn't invited, but hey, there's always politics. But it was, it was interesting, it's just sort of this issue of time available to look at data. And I don't know, you know, we just, um, I know what buddy of mine used to work, I think it was for Chevron, and he said, you know, he says, you think they really want to do interpretation, he says, in the end of the day, they just want red circles on the map, like everybody else. <laughs> you know, the, just give me the answer. And it's tough, uh, but how much patience do people have and time to think about these sorts of data sets? And I, I don't know what the answer is about time, because that's almost a personal thing sometimes, is how much time can you actually spend before you let something go? And as a contractor, I know we get, we get paid to do a certain piece of work. We don't get necessarily paid to come up with an answer. And so we're time limited in a way, unless you really, really work hard and you hang on to something a bit longer and say, I just need to spend a little bit more time on this. And I would say, yeah, I'm pretty forgiving in, in, in our shop that we would do that. But I know, uh, you know, like my, my colleague John here, he's going on. Uh, safety training, he's going in a workshop, he's going to learn how to drive a four-wheel drive again. That's his life for the next two weeks after this conference, right? He's going to be the most trained up guy with no time to do anything with it. Have you, have you driven with John? <laughs> I can tell you two stories. <laughs> Anyways, again, I don't want to, there's just, if any, any other speakers, you want to watch something out or... Did you learn anything, or are you? Can I just? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe a question for Mike. Uh, I just want to explore the idea of these large reservoirs underneath the mining caps. Um, if these things existed, surely we'd be able to see them in our existing data sets. Uh, we've got such great coverage of the whole of Australia magnetically and, and gravity-wise. Can, can we not see them? Uh, I don't know. Perhaps you can. The ones I put up, the, you know, the, 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 the cancer, the Steve put up some um, stuff I hadn't seen before. I mean, those responses were in, um, I think it was in a seismic data set or something. Yeah, I, I suspect we can see them, but have you been looking for them? And then they're probably a bit deeper than, you, than you're probably bothering with, or something yeah. like that. It's a, it's a different pattern style. Right. It's a different pattern style to what's used in normal yep. everyday exploration. So yes, obviously, up the data or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the data is there, but the people haven't looked at it. Okay. They've been yeah. interpreting things in terms of targets they can drill, mm. right? Mm. Whereas they should be looking deeper to see what, what yeah. clues there are to the, to the total system. Mm. The, the, other, the other issue is what clues are a reservoir to a new new floor, and the answer is nil. <laughs> Honestly, and ask Graham. Graham get up in front of his very kind of his 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 desk. I've got the greatest reason we'll put some mining cameras under an Olympic dam and what we're going to say. You know, what plan do you get off? Yeah, you want to No question. You need to be a way forward, but who's going to fund it? Yeah. And the answer is you, Flora. No, uh, and I'm pretty pretty sure it's not major. Flora's not. We're finding a situation where we never get enough energy to get out. It's just a worry. I think, you know, there's, there's a couple of aspects of this. I've been worrying about this problem or not. We, we used to call it kitchens. And, um, you know, always, you know, trying to figure out what the kitchen was. And after a lot of personal sort of agonising over it, I came to the conclusion it is difficult because usually the stuff that's coming out of your thing is reasonably close to equilibrium with what it's doing, or it's so subtly out of equilibrium but it's not actually doing much until all hell breaks loose when it suddenly tips over, whatever tipping point it tips over. But so the, the footprint is, is sort of a much easier thing to look for than the footpath. I think we should probably spend more time in that space than we have. In the immediate, like here and now, what are we going to do in terms of interpreting data better? I think in the longer term, this kind of um, ability to understand geometry is so much better and start to model all these um, sort of unexpected correlations and things like that will demand a certain amount of new meat. We'll need some, a certain amount of new data. But you know, you've still got the essential problem of going from the 
I call them the lithospheric crack mafia. You know, we're going to some 100 kilometres wide and 1,000 kilometres long, getting down to the. I'm going to make a decision on spending a million dollars here, or half a million dollars, or a quarter million dollars, or whatever it is. You know. That's that's always been the gap, and it's, it's shows no sign of closing. Do you think that's the role of universities and governments to find those to find the? Well, in my perception, I think they're the, the current of the groups that are making the most headway in that space. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying we should leave it up to them, but I'm, 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 the most of the creativity I'm seeing in the minerals business in Australia, in any ways, is coming out of those quarters. Then we've, and got, good, a good on then we've got a role to play to help educate yeah. the government to do science. Either way, someone's got to do this work. And the continuity of funding from royalty streams and so is such that you know, we, we have a heavy reliance on the surveys and a heavy reliance on government provided data. And, you know, I accept what Ken said about, you know, like, uh, mag and rads, but, cause it, but we've, in a sense that has been done. There's not much left to do. Except in the states. Except in the states. <laughs> and, and, and large bits of Canada have got mild coverage. And all, you know, so let, let the North American continent's pretty, pretty dismal, really. On the data standard place. But Australia's pretty good. And we have the luxury of going a little better. Gravity and the, and the electric things, I think, are the, the next frontiers. And you know, but the big debate about EM, we'll all have that tomorrow. <laughs> so I'm going to okay. ask Mike what he thought of the Auslan project and how that's going to change things for um, Australia. Our understanding of the. Well, the Auslan has a very cool station space in the middle. It's not like 50 k's or something. It's a long period, so it's very much providing the continental scale framework. So it's, um, when you've got to be practical about you know, how many stations can be realistically connected across the continent. But to me, the, the, the limiting thing on the Auslan is you're going to be getting access to the ground. You know, they're working in areas where they can get to quite easily now, but if they want to get into the Kimberley and the Tanami, you know, the WA perspective, it's going to be I mean, going back to the question about the reservoirs and, and so on, I mean, you're looking at the intermediate scale things, aren't you? That, that the government, so it's going to be government driven incentive kind of work that would, uh, that would that's going to really those things probably. Um, my, I guess my argument would be some different kinds of data may be collected by the government. In addition to you know, higher resolution potential fields and that sort of thing. I had a question for Mark. I apologise because it's kind of a sidestep to your research, but it goes back to the oil and gas theme. We're thinking about 3D systems and models, but we're looking them on a 2D screen. As I wonder if anybody in this room has got experience of. 3D screen, 3D visualisation suites, is there any benefit to them, to them, do you think, or is it just a bit of a, a bit of a I've tried things to um, I think most of what we do, on, I mean, I've used 3D screens, and they're interesting, but I don't think that it's the most important thing. Yeah. I mean, to me personally, and maybe that's something where the next generation of geologists will be so used to having 3D phones that it actually <laughs> is, you know, the, you know, with 3D screens, that it actually is the, the obvious way for things to be done. I mean, I'm just old enough that I actually still write out my papers rather than write them in. I find it easier to, easier, I can do that faster than I can type. But, the, you know, my kids will certainly type rather than writing and maybe their kids will use 3D screens rather than 2D screens. But for me, I'm, my brain is by now hopelessly wired to the fact that I can interpret 3D from a 2D image, that it doesn't make that much difference to me. But that doesn't mean that I, you should use me as a case study. In fact, <laughs> quite the opposite, you should probably use people who don't really think in 3D, and it might make a huge difference for them, whereas me, I, I like to think I already get it. But for people that don't get it, maybe having it in 3D and spinning it around makes a big difference. So, you know, ask somebody that, that doesn't that doesn't think that way. Well, that, that's interesting. You touch, 
the way you said that, in BHP, when I was there, we, we started in the early 90s with these Aeromag training shops, and it was a bit like, I always thought, like uh, what appeared then with, with in, in Star Wars, where the Empire went around and looked for, for Jedi. It really wasn't trying to train most of the people. It was trying to identify the unique individuals who were actually gifted. And because you didn't need, we had 750 people in the exploration group in 1998, but we had probably five or six that could actually sit down and interpret aeromagnetic data flawlessly. We had one person, I remember I hated him, because he could walk around an aeromag map and discuss the 4D tectonics of that environment. Maybe he was totally shining me on. <laughs> he was a pretty arrogant guy, but you know, it seemed to hold water. And um, one of the things that we, we, we speculated, I was asked to at an SME meeting a couple of years ago, about four years ago, who's going to do this interpretation? And I, I was thinking, well, so many kids you talked about was when you said about your children, the gaming paradigm. If we can transfer our information into a gaming mode, we could get many, many, many people playing contests on, on, with geoscience data. Now, of course, not everybody thinks the same way of the buddy of mine in Ontario. He says, think of all the people in the prisons. They're so <laughs> And they're cheap. But they're not making license plates. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, this may be part of what we have to do in terms of, of, of thinking laterally. It's not just bringing things in, but pushing some things out into environments that are, are friendly to some of the problems that we have. If we simply don't have enough people, how do we get people into, that aren't going to become geoscientists, because we don't want too many. You know, we just not enough jobs. <laughs> but we do want answers to our problems, and we can't necessarily just write algorithms all the time. The human brain is extremely powerful, but it probably has to be, you have to sugarcoat some of these problems, I think. so. One, one analogy there is that if companies were freer with their data, more people would find interpreted. Once they've got the ground, they've got the ground. And they're very tight, they, whatever, are very tight with the data. But in a, in a crowdsourcing analogy for our kids, if everybody had to go in interpreting the data, you might learn something. That's right, you transform it into, into paradigms that it, it's no longer magnetics and gravity, it's Klingons and, and leprechauns and hobbits. Anyways. Um, I see people are starting to drift out. I'm going to just say we've got uh, the, the speakers have all basically agreed to allow release of their presentations, but they all changed them. You notice that? They all came out. <laughs> so, uh, we, 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 as, they, as they say, we know where you live. So. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, uh, we'll vet with the speakers again everything that they've got. If there's anything they have to remove, we'll, you know, we'll take care of that. But then we'll send like a Hightail link out to people. The ACG itself really isn't set up to distribute this sort of stuff right now. But John and I are quite happy to organize this at, at our level. Uh, the audio part of it is going to take a little bit longer, but we certainly think we can get you know, decent resolution images of the PowerPoints out. And uh, I would just, uh, as my closing remark, as, as Graham said, you know, time for a beer. I agree with that, but thanks everybody for attending. Uh, I think we had a very good session today, and I'd like to thank all the speakers.